Welcome to the third and final video of the first um, chapter's lecture. Now we're going to turn our attention to a different topic, to the history of biopsychology. So how did we get here? You know, how did we get to where we are at this point? And what stages have we gone through as far as our understanding of biology? So people have been trying to understand the relation between brain and behavior forever. Uh, the early Egyptians and Greeks, including Aristotle, first thought that the heart was the seat of mental um, capacities. And you often you know, hear this in literature, if people still talk about thinking with their heart instead of thinking with their head. It all actually goes back to this idea. This was the initial idea that the heart is actually where we did our thinking. Also, Aristotle actually thought that the brain's purpose, you know, why do we have this brain up here? He actually thought the brain's purpose was to cool the blood, kind of that as a big radiator for the body, which obviously we know is not the case now, but that was the thought back then. Then later, Hippocrates wrote that the brain was the seat of thought and emotion. So this was one of the first times that we had someone saying, no, the brain is more than just a radiator. The brain is actually a place where you're thinking. It's actually important for um, cognition. And then Hydrophilus um, conducted early dissections um, around the same time as Hippocrates, a little bit later. Um, and he, he traced the nervous system. Um, and what he was doing is actually looking at changes in behavior and brain damage caused in gladiators. So it was one of the first times we were looking at what different parts the brain did. And it was being done in a way that we actually still use a lot today, which is when you have brain damage, looking at, well, what deficits do we see? Because that may tell us some about what those areas of the brain do. Then in the Renaissance, um, as the Renaissance picked up, we really got a lot of um, advances in understanding physiology and anatomy. So Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, pioneered um, anatomical drawings. Yeah. Da Vinci is known for many different things, but one of the things they did is a lot of drawings of biology. So you can see you know, some of the differences between his early drawings and later drawings, but the later drawings are actually quite, quite good. Um, so we're starting to get more of an understanding of what our anatomy actually looks like and um, what different components of the brain are present. Then in you know late 1500s, early 1600s, and um, we have Descartes come up, and he was one of the first ones that explained animal behavior in terms of a machine. So what Descartes thought is that um, the pineal gland was actually thought to be the junction between the mind and the body. So and the reason why is because there's only one. As you'll see with our discussion of the brain, there are two of many different things. Pineal gland, there's only one. So Descartes thought this is the connection between the mind and the body, and he thought that both hemispheres come into the pineal gland, and that is where consciousness is held. So in this teeny gland is where you have consciousness. Um, and we know this isn't the case, in part because uh, he didn't know this at the time, but many animals don't have a pineal gland. But it, it was it was a thought, it was a good thought. But he thought of animal behavior um, in terms of a machine, and this was an important step because it got us closer to understanding that you know there are certain pieces that are important for certain behaviors. So he proposed the concept of spinal reflexes and their neural pathways. So explaining that you have reflexes, you know, like when they hit your knee, that your leg jumps, explaining that those occur and also showing how those occur, how the neural pathways connect for those spinal reflexes to occur. And as I mentioned before, um, he viewed the pineal gland as the junction between mind and body. And again, that's because there's only one of those. In the 19th century, phrenology came on the scene. And this this was a big, um, big movement. You still see this around today. You guys have probably seen pictures similar to this. 
but phrenology was a very large movement um, with the thought that certain parts of the brain are responsible for um, different actions or different um, characteristics. So how this was done is they actually correlated someone's behavior, someone's observed behavior, with the shape of their skull. So they would measure people's skull, look at bumps or indentations, um, and they thought that those were signs of either greater or lesser brain density. And then they correlated that with what they saw in that person, saying, oh, if you have a bump here, that must mean that you're extremely giving because they saw that correlation. Um, the idea fell out of favor in the 1900s, but it, it was actually still a step for science because, again, it moves us closer to the idea that certain behaviors and certain abilities are localized to different parts of the brain. It's not quite like this, obviously. There's much more of a network that controls behavior. But the idea wasn't all bad. So with that, I have a brief video. Let me pull this up. And again, for all videos, I'll put the links in the description because I know they can sometimes be a little jumpy. So um, don't worry if you don't see it well on this. Just pull up the video in the description and you can see it there. This next device was called a psychograph. This is an antique phrenology machine invented in 1905, built in Superior, Wisconsin. It measures the bumps on a person's head to see what their personality is like. Phrenology was one of the leading pseudosciences in the 1800s. Its idea was invented by Viennese physician Franz Joseph Gall in 1790, who believed that you could determine a person's character by measuring the bumps on their head. Dr. Gall used to see pictures of Mozart composing music, leaning on his piano with his knuckle against his temple. So he figured, ah, that must be the location of musical skills. He had two acquaintances who were low-life characters who had large bumps above their ears. So he called that part of the brain acquisitiveness. He cataloged the whole brain on these one or two anecdotal bits of information. Dr. Gall became a sensation lecturing on this through Europe. Walt Whitman was a great supporter of phrenology and included many phrenological references in many of his poems and articles. Mark Twain, however, was a great debunker of phrenology and poked fun at it. Phrenology continued as really a parlor game for many years. In the early part of this century, it fell into disfavor. With the discovery of such things as psychology and psychiatry, they realized that our character wasn't determined by the bumps on her head. Bill, come on over here. I need a, victim, a patient to try this out today to see if it's going to work. Sit down here now. This will kind of tickle when it comes down on your head. Now it's going to rate your character one through five, one being deficient, five being superior, on the 32 elements of personality that Dr. Gall invented in 1790 when he invented the idea of phrenology. Now think clean thoughts. Here we go now. Keep breathing now, you're doing fine. Well, it says uh, you have a few things to work on. They're not too serious, though. OK, I'll go over some highlights of what we found out here for you. There we go. This is all about you and a 75-year-old machine right here. This is a, a printout from your reading, Bill have a lot of sexual enthusiasm. You maybe should tone that down a little bit. Your math skills are kind of poor, though. Do you have trouble balancing your checkbook? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. You're quite deficient in your ability to use heavy machinery. Do you run a backhoe, a forklift truck very often? Uh, no. 
and uh, your faith is way too high, Bill. Be careful you're not swept off your feet by some evangelist. Now that's an overview of your personality. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. that phrenology and again that that actually lasted for quite a while that held um held firm through the 1800s until the early 1900s and um what really started changing things was um toward the late 1800s so in the 1860s paul broker you may remember you may have heard of broker's aphasia or broker's area paul broker made a discovery um that supported uh, brain localization of functions. So what he did is he presented a post-mortem analysis of a patient who had been unable to produce speech for many years. And um, actually, it's kind of cruel. The patient could only say the word tan, so they called him tan because that was the only word he could say. Um, so he was unable for many years to produce speech, and upon autopsy, they showed that there's only a very small area in the frontal portion of the left hemisphere that was damaged. So this area became known as Broca's area, and damage known to this became, or this um, type of damage, the result of it, became known as um, Broca's aphasia. Now, um, aphasia is highlighted by an inability to treat words, though an individual is able to understand and respond to words. So it's actually it's not that you don't understand, it's not that you lose your knowledge of language, it's that you can't produce it. And people will talk about this much more later on, but it's actually debated whether um, it's an inability, you know, is it a language problem or is it a muscle problem? It could actually be um, problems with the muscles in your mouth with being able to form the movements that need to be made in order to produce language. So kind of an interesting, interesting question there. But this got us moving toward brain localization, that certain parts of the brain are responsible for certain actions or behaviors or abilities. And although um, there are many behaviors or experiences that appear to be diffusely spread throughout the brain, such as consciousness, um, through animal studies, studies of individuals with brain damage, and also imaging research such as fMRI, what we've been able to identify is that there are certain locations that are vital for many experiences or behaviors. So these, it's not that everything is done in these areas. Almost everything that happens to the brain is a network. It's a bunch of different areas working together to make something happen. But what we see is that there are certain parts that are critical for that ability. So this is just showing some of the aspects that are critical and where, where certain abilities or certain behaviors, where those really rise mostly from. And then biological psychology really took off in the 1900s and it was spurred by William James. Uh, William James is um, in many ways the father of psychology and part of the reason why is he wrote the first psychology textbook called Principles of Psychology. This was huge for psychology. If you ever take a history and systems class, you learn this was monumental. It's just huge because psychology was really limited until then because it's hard to teach without a textbook. So having a textbook in hand that made it so a lot more universities and a lot more people could teach psychology. Um, so it made psychology much easier to teach. So because of that, again, James is often called the father of American psychology. You know, psychology really took off in Europe before it took off in America, but it's because he this textbook was monumental. Um, so in the early in the century, there were many great learning and memory researchers, such as Herman Ebbinghaus, who studied how we measure learning and memory in humans, and Edward Thorndike, 
who examine learning and memory in animals. And also um, Ivan Pavlov, of course, who studied conditioning. These are all people we're going to talk a lot, uh, quite a bit about more. There's also Donald Hebb. Um, Donald Hebb developed the idea of networks of neurons that become organized um, as we develop, and the connections become stronger as neurons fire together. So he referred to these um, networks as cell assemblies, and overall this theory got known as the Hebbian hypothesis. So, um, and again, we'll talk about that a whole lot more too. But as you can see, um, much of the work of psychology as we know it actually occurred in the 1900s. And the same is true for biological psychology. So with that, this is still a very new science. There's a lot we still don't know because we haven't been doing this all that long. So with that, it's, an, it's always an exciting time because there's, there's so much we don't know. And what you'll see as we go on is not only is there a lot we don't know, but the way we know things is often not ideal. Uh, a lot of the findings that we have, while they're great findings, they were by accident. They weren't driven by hypotheses. So it makes you wonder, you know, what things even underlie those that we don't know. So a lot of opportunity, a lot of exciting things and um, things to come. So I look forward to it. And um, I will see you in lecture.